Do you, do you, do you have a key or? Do you <coughs> Use the microphone? I don't think it's not, I'm not sure where you fit. Excuse me, should we use the microphone? No. Just talk to me, is it loud? So my name is <coughs> Gabriel Santos Carneiro. This is Lorena Demar de Simeon Morvan, FOC students. And uh, we're going to make a very brief presentation. Um, I mean, we're going to discuss a bit the concept and try to bring some policy and discussion for uh, concerning the, the topic of violence. Um, so a very brief what's going to happen. Um, first, we're going to just very fast summarize the conclusions and then make a small discussion on the ILM concept, entering to policy, and final, we're gonna push the discussion for us. Um, okay, it's not working, yes. So I'm gonna go very fast through this because we're not sure how, how much Professor would go into the, the, the paper, so since she was like very thorough and we're gonna go very fast, so the paper starts from this idea from the insufficiency of narrow classical definition of violence, the one by Peoria Doniger, she, she mentioned. And uh, I mean, we brought, there is in the article, this quest for defining ILMs. Yeah, and you try to redefine what an ILM would be. So we brought from another article of you that you already mentioned. So the ILMs are firms in general that provide resources for career development, offering the works the opportunity for secure employment and wage progression, as we saw. Also, we can see inter-farm and inter-farm. Um, and then, the main thing of the definition is that ILMs are those which offer longer tenure and, so, and, because it's together, higher wages than others in labor markets. How the paper goes? a comparative analysis of France and Britain, and one thing we thought it was really interesting that it justified the, the selection of the countries was because of their different paths in history, yes. French, mm -hmm. France as an example of state capitalism, and Great Britain as an example of liberal economy, so I think it was a really nice justification also for the selection of the countries. And one thing we would like to mention is that the description and also the data and the methodology 
is very precise and detailed. And it was, for me, it was amazing as a new researcher, as a young researcher to see this in the paper. So I recommend everyone to look to this because sometimes we have to do this description for the first time in our new in our thesis and this time and other places and here it was really good. So I recommend everyone to check because I mean I was quite impressed and I was like okay yes this is how I should do every time I try to do this. Um, so as Professor Petit already mentioned mentioned the article, so the idea is to use fixed effects to estimate establishment's impacts on wages using wage equation and on tenure. And uh, by definition, workplaces with an ILM orientation are those which for a given gender, age, and education profile, yeah, that's how econometric it works, within the workforce have above median job tenure and which for a given gender, age, education, and tenure profile also pay above median wages. So the results, just to summarize, because I went, went to this, so, so you have fresh in this in your minds. Um, there is island profile worker places in both countries with more prevalence in France. Many similar features in both countries. For example, middle-aged workers, qualified male workers, they are the prevalence in Ireland. And uh, also ILM work, work, workplaces are larger in size and older in age than ILM non-ILM workpla workplaces, and some distinctions. French ILMs, um, they use a lot of performance-related pay systems and often adopt a competitive strategy based on quality and innovation, the last thing we saw with Professor. And Brit while British ILMs, on the other hand, they sometimes, yeah, most of the times, don't work with distinctive payment system, and they operate in mature or declining markets and are rarely innovative. So remember this because at the end we're going to bring the discussion of an, maybe an internal, international looking to other countries how to define ILM. So we're going to need to discuss this a bit. Um, also, um, there are so there is this thing the difference in the productive structure of the two economies don't account for the different prevalence in ILMs in the two countries. I think it's something really nice uh, you found in the, in the work because only around one third of the difference in the share of ILMs can be linked to difference in the productive st structures of two economies. So there is still two thirds to be explained and uh, apparently it's not because of the productive structure. So there is a role for the po public policy. It's an open question, yeah, the, 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 workers, the, the work gives to us, and we're going to draw on this. And also the stability of ILM's share of total workplaces, which again was really, yeah, it was a nice finding because you are justifying the, the necessity and the importance of the concept so if ILM's are stable or more or less stable throughout time. Um, it seems that the concept still is connected to something in reality, so pretty interesting. So, going a bit to the ILM's description and then the discussion of ILM's, please go ahead. So, we would like now to go a little bit more into the research on internal labor, uh, labor markets. And as Eloise Putty uh, told us, uh, the, the construct of internal labor markets started with the the work of Doringo and Pure in 1971, and they defined uh, ILM as the pricing, the pricing and the allocation of employees at the firm level, so within the organization rather than through uh, the external labor market. And they defined it as being governed by a set of administrative rules and procedures. Now this definition also goes uh, with the one that uh, Jacobi told us, uh, and sa he says that the development of ILM represents an historical shift from a market-oriented, arbitrary and permanent, impermanent employment system by one that is more bureaucratic, rule-bound, and secure. So the idea is that uh, in uh, internal labor markets, uh, workers would arrive and spend like their career in the firm, like they would start yeah. from a low uh, skill position and uh, have like career progression through uh, and through like uh, internal trainings, uh, upskilling, and would 
arrive at more advanced position. And other characteristic of ILMs are also that the fact uh, that they are um, they have more integrated tray structures uh, and also permanent environment contracts. So now I wanted to highlight also a quote of Osterman that is also a prominent uh, researcher on ILM. And he says that uh, internal labor markets provide a fruitful research arena for a variety of disciplines and intellectual perspective. And that ILM represents a structured pattern of interaction or behavior that persists over time and which is uh, subject to change. Which means by this definition that ILM are still uh, relevant for um, our current uh, modern employment practices. And uh, as Eloise Poti uh, pointed out, it's like um, a, a question that's very debated in the field of labor economics uh, about whether uh, islands are still relevant uh, today. Uh, so I wanted to highlight a little bit this debate uh, and also uh, some arguments on both sides. So for some, uh, for some researchers, they point out the fact that Employers now heavily depend on external factors to manage employees. So like the fact that uh, there are uh, new uh, forms of, uh, of work, there are increased competition, there are new management techniques, uh, public policy, uh, this is something that Kapili points out. Uh, also the fact that uh, there is like the emergence of information uh, and communication technologies and that uh, firms like goes more to external labor to like find the skills and like in, instead of like finding them uh, within uh, the organization. Um, now they are like of course uh, scholars that believe that they are still a future outlook for like uh, uh, for internal labor markets. Uh, one argument that you also pointed out in the paper is that. Uh, firms have like several human resource uh, strategies creating different uh, employment systems. So the fact that for workers there would be like um, availabilities for like uh, and they can expect uh, longer term employment and for others uh, that might be the contrary, there might be like quicker employment conditions and this is also due to like socio-economic uh, characteristic uh, gender, education level, uh, ethnic background. Um, another argument is that uh, firms like policies and procedures within the organization are influenced by contextual factors like trained unions roles, uh, social protection legislation. Uh, the example, for example, in France, uh, like uh, one paper that uh, we looked at it was uh, from the Hagel. Uh, and we, we saw that like, through the development of ICT, um, we actually in France didn't see like, a decrease in internal labor market uh, practices um, because one hypothesis was the fact that there is like, strict protective employment legislation in France. So like, these are some arguments of the debate of whether internal labor markets are still relevant today. Of course, we can go on and on uh, on this debate, these are just a uh, limited view, uh, but I will now like, uh, give the floor to Simeo. So, I think on all the reasons explaining why you have different proportion between the ILM in France and in England, there are also like more basic economic reasons will be like thus the difference between the advantages of having ILM in your country and disadvantages. So these are advantages for both the employees and the employers. And uh, we just created a list which is give, give like kind of some examples. First, having ILM allows for more growth of human capital. If you have a long tenure, you're spending a lot of time this in the same company. You have more time to develop your human capital than going from the companies to companies. There is also this really important factor, which is the job security. The fact that you're going to be paid at the end of the month that is going to stand for, for longer than that. So kind of you can build other projects, build a family, or even having loans. And also, it enhances the network externalities. Since people in the Alliance spend a lot of time together, it is the opportunity to develop their network. So there is a growth of, of all the outcome you can, you can create with these ILMs. Then, you have also other advantages like 
the, the target, the, the targeting the needs of the companies. Basically, the companies can choose through the LEM. They can choose like what they want to teach to the people. They can choose their speci specific training. They can develop the skills they really need in the company. And also another more practical advantage that it allows you to protect the trade secrets. It's you keep your employees. They're not going to go to the other companies working in the same field. And it also to have a control of the information, which is really important in a, on specific markets. But at the same time, maybe, for example, in some countries, you don't have as many ILMs because of the disadvantages you can face. For example, there is a psychological effect, which is called the escalation of commitment, which is basically the idea that all the decisions that you are going to take because of the decisions you took, you're going to keep going and uh, in the uh, following the previous decisions, even though there are bad ones for you. So for example, if an employee is spending a lot of time in a company, even though he's not productive, even though he's not, he's, even though he's not happy, there's no, he's, he's more helpful for the company than anything else, he's going to keep going, and the ILM could reinforce this effect. They have also, of course, uh, from a liberal point of view, the effect, the issue of the social control. Since if the, the employees spend a lot of time in the same company, then the social control is stronger than if it changes, uh, if uh, employees change like every, every month, every year. There are also potential unemployment traps. Since if you spend all your life in, the, in a specific field or in a specific company, and suddenly the, uh, the, uh, suddenly the company is not profitable anymore, you're going to be an employed. It's going to be much harder to find a new company since you're already used to the previous one. And then there are also the, the uneven effects of external employment markets. Maybe if you're, uh, if you're strengthening the internal employment market, then it's going to harm the external one, like it's a communicating uh, relationship between the two different markets. So, uh, actually, depending on a lot of uh, situations, you have to assess the uh, cost-benefits analysis. Is it depending on the culture, on the history of the country, on the economic structure? Is, does it depend also on the labor market characteristics? Does it depend on the field? And uh, then there is also this thing that there is a, a sense of inequalities before people inside the internal labor market with the, uh, with the long tenure, the high the wages, and the people who are not inside. Then, when all this cost-benefit analysis is made, we can go to a set of policies that we're starting thinking about, so we can debate about it later. So it's like small ideas that we found by ourselves who could enhance the development of ILMs. So it will be, for example, for a tax reduction based on the tenure of the employees. The longer the employees are in the company, the, 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 lower, the, tax, uh, the lower the taxes of the company are. Easy. Then you can have the issue, then the counterparty that you can have side effects like, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, what, actually? <laughs> Sorry, the, the... Um, no, oh yes, excuse me, it's, it's really simple. Basically, you're going to keep employees who are not productive, who have, uh, like, uh, well, yeah. so we, we, we could be the side effect. Then there is also this idea of basing the remuneration on shares of the company, so when an employee is starting working for a company, if he at the same time of his fixed wage is going to get a share of the company, then he's going to, he's going to, to, he's going to own a part of the company and it's going to increase its fidelity, the, pro the probability that he's going to stay in the company is higher. Then if like the employees are uh, owning the shirt of the company, there is another issue. How are you going to fund the economy then if it's, uh, if it's, owned, by the, if it's all owned by the employees? Or like a more strict, a harsher policy will be like penalties for the companies with a high turnover. Really easy. You punish them so it, it, will, it sh should help reducing the turnover. And uh, now we're done with the policy, we can stop getting into the discussion and I'm going to leave the room to Gabriel. Yeah, just one last before we kick start. Yeah, this is a kick start of the discussion. So, I mean, we already brought some kind of provocative policies, I would say, and uh, we invite you all uh, to also 
think of policies that could uh, pay maybe uh, induce silence or not, or not, maybe you are against it also, yes. Um, but then there are some specific questions we brought, and uh, I think uh, most of them are, we would like to hear your answer, Professor Petit. So the first one would be about Brexit, and uh, I mean, now that Great Britain is not part in the European Union anymore, um, what do you think if there was a role of EU shaping ILMs in these countries or not? And uh, so this is the behind question. Yes, the Brexit is like happened, Great Britain is outside. So was there, you think, maybe uh, an institutional setting posed by EU that would make maybe this, or you think there are, you can expect no changes after? Um, a second question we brought, uh, which, would be, which would be, I don't know, in the same direction, going a bit further, if ILMs are sector specific. And uh, in the article, you show how ILMs are more pres present in some sectors. However, our question are more like, okay, are these sectors prone to develop ILMs or not? Because as you know from history, there will be like a delocalization, for example, of industrial activities through Southeast Asia, for example. And uh, can we expect, for example, these industries to keep ILM characteristics there or not? Yes. And if not, um, what would be the, the institutional settings or the policies? So you leave here policy implications for the emergence of these ILMs. Um, and are these settings present? doable or attainable for developing countries, for example, um, because obviously the analysis is based on Britain and French and multiple, yeah, two of the most developed economies in the world. And uh, if I could add one more question that I do mind, that we had uh, during the, I came up in my mind during the presentation, because the definition in the article is completely, the definition of ILM is completely empirical. Yes, you put the, the, the companies, uh, you get the, the above median in wage, the above median in tenure. And I was thinking, for example, how to apply a similar methodology for a country that has already very lower wages and very lower tenure, for example, I don't know, we take a developing country. So even the above median wage would be maybe a very low wage. So is, would you think of a lower boundary for defining ILMs? Or yes, or maybe, I don't know, I was thinking the other way around too, like um, maybe a country with more than half of its enterprises that are ILMs, how would we account in this method? Because it would be always above median. Um, Yes, okay. I, I think it's pretty interesting, yes, and uh, I don't know if you'd like to mention something, and Lorena and uh, Simeon? No? Sorry? Okay. I, think, I think we already had a lot of questions, <laughs> yes. basically. So, uh, Thank you. Maybe, yeah. maybe Okay, so thanks a lot for this uh, very uh, thoughtful and precocious reading and, well, all your, all your comments and, and element for discussion.
And indeed, there is one result uh, I didn't have time to raise about the impact of the predictive system, because a lot of people would say, OK, the difference between the two countries is only due to different predictive systems, because they have different sectors that are developed. And indeed, for this part, we did some econometrics about it to show that it was only partially. Uh, the difference in, in the spreading of INMs is only partially due to uh, predictive structure. So there's really something else going on. So now, obviously, it's not easy to point how come it's different. And it's a question of maybe I will start on this question in, of uh, international heterogeneity and, and what country we can compare. So you ask question. <laughs> Bring in your first comment and your last question. And I'll try and go um, on all of them some ways. Uh, well, you'll tell me if I miss some of them. but. Um, well, the point is, we, they are very different economies in their functioning, but they're also very similar in the level of developments, obviously. So same, uh, globally, same size of population, of uh, uh, GDP, so very comparable in some way. So it, we could build on a pooled data set for those, but definitely I wouldn't do that comparing, let's say, uh, Brazil and France. Obviously, we couldn't put this threshold at the same level. And if you read to the last page, you've, you would have seen, or maybe you've, you did actually, but to the others, in the papers, one thing we did is draw the distribution of fixed effect in the two countries. Okay, before putting them together, we kind of, uh, well, checked they had the same kind of distribution. And obviously, I would expect that if you would do a pool data set with a really different country with totally different structure of the economy, while the distribution of wages and the moreover, the distribution of fixed effect would be even more different than what we have for Britain and France. So there, the comparability of having the same threshold would be difficult to ground. So yeah, basically, I suspect this method is only applicable uh, for comparative analysis among similarly developed countries, which would mean you could have the same method for two countries uh, very different from Britain and France, but in, in common, uh, with some commonalities between the two of them, obviously, because you're having a common threshold. And at least the point is, this needs to be discussed and looked at before doing it, of course. The, the, this is why we have this graph. I think we have them in the final version of the paper, but whatever, we've looked at them, actually. <laughs> and, we, and we did uh, be cautious on that, and I would recommend to be cautious on that. Now, on a more general point, um, Still, the method can be used elsewhere in another context whenever you're comparing similar countries and still may be useful. Obviously, the literature on labor market segmentation and on dualism has been very intense also on developing countries in quite different terms because it's a lot of it would raise the difference between formal and informal part of the economy. But, well, in countries where the informal part is big enough, obviously, uh, it comes close to this question. And once again, it's basically a lot about firm strategy that would choose to go formal or informal before the workers would choose, actually. So you would have some analogy between the two literature. But unfortunately, it's true that over the past uh, and the last decades also, they have been developed quite separately. So I wouldn't be at ease uh, totally translating what we're saying here about what would be in, in another context, in a developing country context. Um, yeah, about the impact, I mean, and, uh, well, in, we, when you would compare Britain and France, for example, one usual point would be to, well, a classic point would be to say, OK, there, this table workers, sorry. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, all these stable workers is due to employment protection legislation, okay? And there's really this idea that it is because the state is very important and the labor law is very rigid, uh, the quotes in France, that would um, explain all that and explain the firm strategy. I would definitely argue this is not the key point for several reasons. One is in another paper <laughs> I did, so I'll come to it afterwards. Uh, or maybe it's the first reason uh, to say it. Um, it's another paper then with another colleague working on uh, <coughs> employment adjustment in French firms. Okay, So we would look at 
firms who change their employment level on a yearly basis, like they have 10% less of employment or 10% more or whatever, whatever change they have in their employment level, through what type of contract do they have entries and exit to obtain that, okay? If you have 10% work, imagine your 100 workers at the beginning of the year, your 90 at the end of the year. So this can be 10 exit. It can be also 20 entries and 10 exits. It can be 10 exits of short-term contracts. I mean, you have multiple possible ways to do that. Well, the usual say would be to say the French firms would only rely on short-term contracts, okay? Because of employment protection legislation that would impeach them to adjust through uh, the change in uh, open-ended contracts, okay? And this situation for France has actually only been studied once in the 1980s. Well, basically in an American Economic Review paper, so everybody <laughs> just based on that would say, okay, it's enough, and we don't need to look at the subject anymore, but it was 1990s, 1980s data for three years, etc. So basically we had much better data, much longer period, and we tried to look a bit again and separate between short-term and open-ended contracts. And basically firms do adjust through the change in numbers of open-ended contracts. Okay. And you have some firms who would do a lot of uh, moves, a lot of entries and exits through short-term contracts, but as we can see for individual level data, this is focused in some sectors. Okay. And even in those sectors, when they really want to change their level of employment, not the churning, like the usual churning, uh, usual change in, in employment level, but a real change in employment level, a real stable or long-term change in employment level, well, this actually goes through a change in the number of open-ended contracts, okay? So, and this, w the picture we have for France with this data is strictly very close to what a lot of other colleagues have found for other countries. So this is, for me, clearly a point where, okay, if firms want to do something, it's not about labor law that impeaches them to do whatever, okay? And we're talking here about uh, most of the firms have no problem about setting the things right and respecting the law and having no problem about being sued by the workers or whatever, and they know how to uh, dismiss the worker if they want to, and basically they do, okay? So this is from this other paper, but for me, really a hint that uh, there's no impact of, I mean, we can't, uh, put everything on the back of <laughs> employment protection legislation here. Another, uh, another part of the response would be looking at, well, this other paper, we we're looking at the employment models in the two countries. We would spot at the idea that there's much more heterogeneity, as I said, in the British case. But it's also, uh, what we can see behind that, it's also the other characteristic we find for the British model is much more instability and much less links between actors. And this is, holds up a different type of actors. Meaning on the other side, for France, we found much more homogeneity, okay, among categories, and much more links between actors and much more stability. And that is the way it functions. I mean, this is like historical path. And so this is the habit, this is the way of functioning, and this is on what people built, much more than the actual law of what rate of penalty you're gonna have for if you dismiss a worker, you shouldn't. Uh, and <coughs> so this is much more structuring, has a much more structuring effect. This path dependency about the way the economies function definitely would have more impact on uh, on their future trajectory than an actual low that would change mar marginally, okay? So this means that a given low or a given change will have basically different impact in different countries. And, well, just to say for HR practices, and, and here I'm building also on the work by the colleague David Marston, who showed how well, all these HR practices that are quite diffused in France, much more than in other countries, it's also due to the importance of employer uh, organizations in France. 
And again, it's not EPL. It's because we have a lot of employer organization and they're doing a lot of training between them, them a lot of sharing of good practices. And this is actually fuels the diffusion of these practices. Okay? Whereas in the British case, he would spot that this may be a reason why they are not so diffuse, this type of HR practices. So let's say I, I don't want the EPL to be the tree hiding the forest. And <laughs> I mean, there's huge institutional practice and institutional uh, and um, past dependency about the way the economic, the economy functions and the labor market functions. That is much more uh, important, I think, in, in defining the way we are going than uh, this and that specific law. Um, of course, you can still have marginal impact on these trends with a low, and hopefully we want that because we want to be able to do something and try to change. Maybe it's not only by low and or by soft low, but still we want to um, be able to influence that, and we can, obviously, in some by to some extent. And typically, when you're talking about the tax reduction proposition, and, well, quite similarly for the penalties for companies with high turnover, you actually have, uh, this is the exact spirit of the bonus-malus uh, reform, uh, which is taking, uh, taking uh, well, started <coughs> theoretically one year ago, but is actually starting now, which basically is a tax on French firms that is more important the more short-term contract you have. Okay? So the more short-term contract you have, the more employment um, cotization, the more employment insurance cotization, the, the more important will be your employment insurance cotization as a firm. Okay? So this is going to be marginal, but definitely, I mean marginal in terms of cost, obviously, but not marginal for firms who use a lot of these. Okay? So, well, happy, you'll be happy to hear this is actually getting in place now, <laughs> your proposal. And hopefully it may have an impact, especially for those firms who use a lot of these um, type of contracts. And to some extent, the law on uh, dismissals and dismissals penalty, and uh, what you must pay when you dismiss a worker, which is actually increasing with its seniority, and this would go the other way around from what you're proposing, because it's obviously focused on protecting the workers. Okay, and not uh, changing the firm's uh, strategy. Well, what I would mainly point is also the idea that the, I mean, there's a lot of uh, public policy right now about uh, training. And it's all focused on workers, and which to some extent is great because it's good that workers can decide where they want to train, obviously. But it should also, uh, at some point, be clear that the focus also has to be on the responsibility of firms to actually train their workers to be able to go in new development, new jobs, and not only on the workers to get the train for the good qualification to go on the new jobs. So typically the segmentation point of view would be to have this focus also on employees, on employers, sorry. Maybe you want a time for general discussion? <laughs> I'm seeing you coming. Okay, so I'll mix the answers to the others with the other questions. Okay, maybe we we'll collect two or three questions and then uh, okay. tell, tell your name. Uh, Clear. Thank you so much for your presentation. But I guess, like on a more general level, I'm kind of wondering why we're presuming that these are good things, and that I'm wondering why we're presuming we should be making this more widespread because from what you're showing the when you look at the like composition of the sectors that this is happening in, I have manufacturing, utilities, construction, finance, and business, and where it's not happening is hotel, retail, personal service, there's a huge gender dimension to that. And there's also when you think of like global care chains, uh, connection to the global south there. So and also in like what you were saying about the law, why would we presume that by making this more widespread, somehow the pool of people who will be benefiting from this will be somehow more diverse, if you're saying as well that law doesn't have so much of an impact on the outcome? Um, I have a more historical question. Christoph. Um, and uh, when I, if I understood you correctly, you concluded kind of that the, this 
sometimes this picture that um, the job market is much more like volatile nowadays. It's not really accurate. You still have like this high correlation between high wages and high tenure. And I'm wondering if I understood it correctly how you did it. You like calculated, like you made a regression and um, um, said that high tenure is like what is above average. Um, so I'm wondering, could not be the case that in comparison to some decades before, you have like all workers like in absolute levels are not employed in the same um, firm quite long, but there is still a correlation between like the very low tenure you are in some place and the high wage. Joao, uh, I have two questions, two short questions. First, thank you uh, for the presentation, the paper. Um, so first, you, you touched upon um, the differences in productive structure, uh, but in, inside of that, I was wondering if the presence of ILM could not also be representing concentration of the markets, in the sense that maybe uh, because one country has more concentrated markets, you have some companies that are able to pay higher jobs, higher wages and so on. Um, and a second question, on the slide where you presented the difference, uh, you presented what are the characteristics of the ILM companies in, in Britain and France. Uh, I was wondering, is the, the story that you're telling there that the leading firms in both countries now are doing less uh, protection to workers in that sense. Because if I understand it correctly, that side it was saying that the, that the companies with ILM, they are not the leading firms, and they are um, also decreasing uh, in the market shares. So that means that firms that are doing less protection are, are getting more productive, having more space in the market of today. Is this the narrative? Okay, I give a reasonable amount of time, but not too much to <laughs> <laughs> And then we take a second one. Okay, I'll try to leave space for the second round. <laughs> Is that it? Um, okay, I think I can connect two questions. Uh, this, well, your first one and yours. Because when I say make it more widespread, or I mean as a political, as a question for public policy, it's basically the idea is that. Um, giving more people the opportunity for a career, basically for a good job and, and wage increase opportunity and opportunity to be stable if you want to. Um, and the idea is not having it increase, especially in some sectors. Obviously, the idea would be to how should we develop ILMs or this type of good working condition in other sectors. And this is basically a point where it has to change in nature because uh, here, obviously, it's somehow built on rents, uh, different types, and this is how it connects to market concentration and firms having enough market power to pay for that. Basically, there's a lot of funding here to have a long-term investment in their workers. You have to get money to do that. Obviously, it's not that the other firms are just uh, bad employers that don't want to be nice to their workers. <laughs> Obviously, it's because they don't have the economic condition to do that. And this is where public policy can intervene. I mean, if you look at our uh, um, personal service sector, well, basically, the funding for personal service is the state. Okay? And at some point, the state could decide to invest in this sector and to invest in human capital in this sector and to recognize qualification and the usefulness of long-term investment in a relationship for this sector. And because it's, it's not the same valuation that can be, you cannot rely on an economic, strictly economic valuation, but still, okay, you can still try and translate the concept into such type of sector but you can't ground it on the same economic forces. It won't come uh, alone, basically. So it's a bit of the same response for, for your question on the role for concentrated market. Uh, it can't be everywhere. And same for small firms. I mean, they won't uh, easily have, they, they need huge HR department. You need jobs to get 
to get career opportunity, basically. So here you would maybe need to think of grouping firms on a local basis or sectoral basis, whatever. I mean, there is, there is a room for invention here in terms of public policy. And, um, well, I, I would just mitigate the idea that they're not leading firms. Okay, you are here on national or international market. I mean, you can't have expect firms to be like startups just doubling every year, okay? If they're on mature market, it's each time some mature or declining, okay? So you have the two options. And at some point, uh, in terms, I'm not especially for competitive development of market, but at some point, I mean, these are places also where you're stable and you can have long-term prospects. When you're a booming firm, okay, you can invest, etc., but maybe ha not have the same stability in, in the vision of what you're doing. So it may be not a so bad position. I mean, declining market does not mean you're a declining firm. <laughs> and, uh, it means it's an old market. I mean, you can also interpret it this way. Uh, just a quick answer, <laughs> if you want to last a uh, turn, um, about volatility. Yeah, there's an important point here about the increased inequality in mobility, okay, as for other sites. But it's more rarely said this way because, to, to some extent, because people were so impressed about increased mobility in the 1990s, there has been this uh, maybe a scaring effect that everybody would get mobile, okay? The idea here and that we can see if we look at data on mobility, and I do some other work on that, uh, is that we have more uh, unequal. So much more mobility for those who were already mobile and those who have like the bad characteristics, okay? Those on the lower end of the labor market. But what we can see is we have still stable workers on the other side and even more stable for some, okay? To some extent, we don't know how this is going to be after um, all the retirement of a long-term <laughs> career. At some point, maybe they are going to be a, a bit less stable, but still for now, the first effect is more stability uh, hanging uh, just in front of more mobility. So I'm finished. The second question is, do ILM firms survive better in periods of crisis? Is there any data on that? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the presentation. Your message is... Marianne. Um, you mentioned in the conclusions uh, like the need to, to do research in terms of uh, fragmentation inside companies. Uh, I wanted to know your comments on how digitalization and the way that they redefine labor relationships have an impact in the ILM concept? Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. I think my question is, um, I have two questions. The first is similar to Joel's question about how um, the market concentration is. I would imagine in my country that um, those who you would say have ILM um, workplaces, maybe higher median wages, are those who don't have very good work balance at first. They don't have like, a good work-life balance. And secondly, they, there are not many other um, firms offering that opportunity. So I mean, maybe there could be some more information about the market concentration in good places. I think you mentioned there are really similar structures, but is there really any significant difference in that? And then like, um, I know we also want to give a more empirical uh, definition to ILMs, but if, if I were to talk about that within a developing country context, um, work-life balance would be important because while you're earning high wages, while you have a high tenure, um, do you really have time for like family, um, social life generally? Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Um, I look I, I wanted to ask because um, I think we, we also looked a bit on like the historical changes how the amount of um, these kind of companies changed. And so I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think um, the effect of like uh, the, the increase of companies that might uh, re misrepresent employees as like contractors 
and thereby like probably an increase of big firms that have very bad working conditions that will now not uh, fall as much like with as strong of a weight in these studies because these people are not uh, classified as employees of firms employees of firms with more than 11 people people um, so I guess that that data is very rare on that but maybe if you could uh, tell your thoughts on that how that would affect the results okay um, hello thank you for um, you said that in France, regarding the competitive setting, um, island firms um, operate in a stable or decreasing volume of business market, but they have a, an innovative uh, competitive strategy. I found that a bit counterintuitive, maybe. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is the case? The micro <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. I have uh, less than one minute. Or no, we can. We, ooh. Oh, I'm going to answer everyone. Uh, cool. Um, oh, my not. Oh <laughs> this is so quick. No, I'm not sure I can read it. Um, Okay, about connection, and there were also another question I didn't answer about that. So maybe it's I'll start with this idea of um, island firms, which actually could have different policies in a country and another. Or well, I would definitely say yes, even if I'm not. I mean, you would need empirical work, obviously, to uh, have a real response to that. But uh, my hypothesis would be clearly yes, because a point I did not raise here is that French ILM are known to have different uh, policies. Uh, well, at least historically, they have been pointed as having different policies for different types of workers, meaning these types of uh, investment and career opportunities are given to a subset of workers, which is basically a majority. But then you have the others. And typically, those on, on um, temporary contracts that like try to get in, basically, the ILM for years, and most of them can't. Okay, never get to a stable position and career opportunity. So if they can do that in the same country, I suspect they would have no problem doing it differently in another country. Okay, there's no reason why it should just spread naturally. Okay, at some point these are firms that try to invest uh, like um, to their optimal minimum. I mean, all these. And, and the, to the optimal minimum that would raise the maximum profit. I mean, the, the, the reasoning of firms here is described in a very classic way. I mean, there's, it's no, we're not talking about like some nice um, uh, firms that would spread money over their workers. They are doing that because they find it uh, kind of uh, beneficial in terms of returns. And they won't do it if it's not beneficial. But at some point, I mean, this does not say they won't do it, but does not say they will do it neither. See what I mean? So there's no a priori in one sense or the other here. Uh, regarding the question on digitalization, um, I, I would link it to the work balance question in a weird way, <laughs> because what basically the segmentationist approach tells us is you can't look at these type of question in a unique way. Okay, digitalization and will have completely different effect on ILM type of firms and secondary labor market type of firms. And if you want to understand the impact of digitalization on the labor market and what it does to work, to workers and to work, you have to separate different positions. Okay? And otherwise, you, you will just uh, mix questions which are not the same ones. And if you're talking about digitalization, like platform workers, for very low qualified jobs, you're in secondary market, of course, uh, kind of question. But if your work is a uh, digitalization for uh, foreign from office, I mean, uh, I can't remember the word, but working foreign from office and, and digital communication, then you would be <coughs> in ILMs. Okay, so you would have different <coughs> facets of a question. And what is according to me, very important uh, from the message from segmentation literature, or this ILM literature, would be the need for these different facets okay, in understanding a question. And typically for a work-life balance, well, again, it would be pointing at, okay, there's a bad work, <laughs> there's two types of bad work-life balance. 
And basically, in these big firms that gives opportunity for career, yes, they may be real demanding, but they also will be the firms which will, will offer kindergarten for the uh, children and would offer parental leave for uh, um, um, children's sickness. And okay, so it would be a different sort of constraint than for others that would have like a five hours uh, um, or let's say three hours a day work as a cashier, at two hours in the morning and one late evening, which is another much more intense problem of work-life balance. So again, the main idea here is you just can't have a uniform way of presenting things and there's a real interest in differentiating the way you're questioning. And there's a real, you have to see it as a heuristic device, okay? And in the same way, whatever you're looking at, there is the, the main message here would be, okay, you need to have in mind that it's not a uniform impact and you will better understand the subject if you at least have two categories. <laughs> And already with two, you see much more than with one category and analyzing the impact on the labor market. I'm not, I'm not sure, I don't know if I've been convincing about work-life balance and digitalization, but you can see that there's real different problems actually that are at stake from which type of workers, which type of firms you're looking at. Um, yeah, about your question, well, Maybe it's not so, again, I'm not at all a specialist about competition and, how, uh, and, and, um, and industrial economics, but basically you can also imagine that on international markets, just staying alive needs a lot of innovation. <laughs> staying there and stay on this, uh, I mean, more than national level market. I mean, there's other firms uh, from some other countries that are always there open to get your market. So being there and stable, already needs a lot of innovation, maybe. But it's a hypothesis. 